And so it says that God caused this woman to be childless because he had a great plan for Israel. God hears the prayers of deeply hurting people. And where this woman who was barren became fertile and the country was transformed and God raised up one of the greatest men he's ever raised up. readings this morning, a statement that really caught my eye, and um, I'll just tell you what it was. I hope you are all in a good position to be comfortable, at least in here. Prayer discovers God's agenda. Our pastor has been talking about the year ahead. I like that statement, Matthew. Prayer discovers God's agenda. Now, uh, tonight, um, I'm not sure that it's announced anywhere, but here at 7 o'clock, there's a gathering for prayer here at the church. That's tonight for 7 o'clock. The second thing is, um, I think pastor and the leaders of this church for the, the opportunity to share the word this morning. I've felt very lent on God about it. And the, the subject topic is that of God hears the prayers of deeply hurting people. Now, there is a lot of people that we're not aware of that are going through trials and deep hurts. Um, what the story or, or the Bible passage will be about is someone who prayed for a baby who was already sterile, that is, barren. Okay? And now, and this woman who prayed while sterile, received not only a baby, but a mighty reformer that then ended up changing a whole nation. Hallelujah. But it reminds me of a, a story I once heard of a little boy. He was probably four or five. And uh, he was lonely because he never had a little sister. And so when Daddy went with him at night time to say prayers and 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 um, and read him a story, he said to Daddy, "Daddy, I feel sad because I haven't got a little sister." Well, he didn't know what was coming, of course. But, um, and so they started to pray each night and Daddy would be with him before he went to sleep and they'd pray and, dear Lord, please give me a little sister. And after a while, like most of us, you know, we gave up praying. You know how we really set ourselves to pray sometimes and sure we're not going to stop, but we do. Well, that happened. And 
the little boy, Johnny, noticed that his mummy had a what we call a baby bump. Ha ha. He said, Mum, have you been eating too much chocolate? She said, Go and play, little fella. And we'll talk about it later. Well, that wasn't the last of it because mummy got bigger. And mummy got bigger. And mummy got bigger. She was huge. The day came, she went down to the hospital to give birth to this baby sister. And, and little Johnny said, Daddy, can we go and see my baby sister? He says, well, what, hold on, son. Uh, later on this evening, we'll get down there after work. And so Johnny and Daddy go down to the hospital and where's my baby sister? And he said, well, let's go to the nursery and see your baby sister. Oh, he said, Daddy, oh, I'm excited. He said, where is she, Daddy? He said, there and there and there. <laughs> and Daddy said to Johnny, aren't you glad that I prayed? And Daddy said to Johnny, Uh, and and then the little fellow turned around and he said, Yes, Daddy, I'm, I'm glad we prayed, but aren't you glad I stopped? <laughs> now, I, I have amazing stories about people, and I'm talking about people right here in Australia, who were prayed for, who couldn't have children. And in other parts of the world, and I'm talking about our, our present sort of generation. So this morning we're going to turn to the scriptures and it's in the first chapter of 1 Timothy. Okay, Timothy chapter 1 comes after Ruth in the Old Testament. I, what did I say? First Samuel, I mean. First Samuel. Okay. Samuel chapter 1. And we'll probably dodge a few of the big names here. But I want to tell you something. This passage has been preached to death on Mother's Day. I'm not giving you a Mother's Day service today. I want you to see an amazing aspect of a woman who is at the end of herself and hurting very deeply. So let's read together first, and then we'll look at the thoughts. And there was a man, and we won't go into all the words and, and the, the, the son of who and the son of who, but it says that this man, Elkanah, okay, he had, verse 2 says, that he had two wives. Now there's a man that likes a challenge. Okay, he had two wives. And one's name was Hannah and the other one was Peniah. Peniah had children, but Hannah had none. Year after year, this man went up from the, his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh. And, and Shiloh was a part, uh, what was where the tabernacle stood before it went into, uh, it's a part of the Jerusalem complex where it went into, later into the temple of Solomon. And so it says, they went to this place regularly every year where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife Benaiah and her sons and daughters 
But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, even though she was deeply sad. He loved her, and the Lord closed her womb. And so God's about to do something here. If the Lord closes the womb, then God's about to do something. And it's recorded in many places in Scripture where this happened. Okay. And because the Lord had closed her womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her until she wept and would not eat. That was a sad situation. It went on year after year. Elkanah, her husband, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you, in other words, feeling so depressed? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more than ten sons to you? Once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, she stood up, Hannah stood up. Okay. Now, Eli, the priest, was sitting on a chair near the doorpost of the Lord's temple. That was the tabernacle. Now, I, I think this man did a lot of sitting. I think, he did, I, did, I think he did more sitting than standing. Okay. In bitterness of soul, Hannah wept much and prayed to the Lord. She made a vow saying, O Lord Almighty, if you will only look upon your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give me a son, give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life. No razor will ever be used on his head. Now, let me tell you what that means. It means... He had the, he took the, or she took the Nazarite vow. And the Nazarite vow meant set apart for the whole of your life to the Lord. Okay? And one of the stipulations was that no razor would touch his hair. And you remember Samson lost his power when a razor did touch his hair because he was another one with the Nazarite vow. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, and I want to add, from her heart. And her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk. And said to her, how long will you keep getting drunk? Get rid of your wine. Verse 15. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. And I have been not drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of the great anguish and grief that I'm feeling. Okay. Eli answered, Go in peace, and may God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. And she said, may your servant find favour in your eyes. Then she went her way, ate something, and her face no longer looked downcast. I like that. Out of depression, into God's favour. Early the next morning, they arose and worshipped before the Lord, and then 
went back to their home at Ramah. Elkanah lay with Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah received, I shouldn't read that again, in the course of time, Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son. She gave him the name Samuel, saying, Because I asked the Lord for him. Heavenly Father, please speak to us this morning through your word. Show us what you can do with the weakest of people. Show us what you can do when everything's at the bottom. And Father, we ask this in your lovely name and for your glory. Amen. Now then, let me first say that Israel was virtually at the bottom. There was corruption, big time, and immorality, and a disregard for God among the priesthood of the day. You know that the tribe of Eli was the tribe from which the priests would come, the, the tribe of Levi. And it was from that tribe that Eli, the high priest, and these two sons of his, came according to this account now what do we first see that the nation needs a miracle as Australia does and as our churches do the miracle of God speaking into his people and out of it coming revival and morality, and purity, and love, and loveliness. Now if I get excited, and I fire up in this pulpit this morning, don't you get too concerned, because we desperately need a move from God. And every day, when I go to have my quiet time, and my wife and I pray together, we get up in the morning, we have one banana each, potassium galore. And we have a pod coffee. I peel the bananas, my wife makes the pod coffee. She's a sweetie, I tell you. But when I go, then we go into our own, we have an office each and we go for our quiet time. But what bears down in my heart is the state of the average church growing backwards instead of forwards of the apathy, of the lack of praise, of the negativity that's in the minds of God's people all the time rather than his praises. We need a heaven-sent, devil-chasing revival, don't we? And we need it now. We don't know whether in the next month we're going to be reported as having uh, 40,000 cases of, of uh, COVID, do we? We don't know. We're thankful for those who help us with this situation and all that stuff. But I've been wondering, is God trying to say something to us as a world and as a nation? And will God say something to us this morning about what prayer means in the heart of a hurting person? You might be feeling down about things. You might be feeling weak about things. You might say, I have been praying for so long. I've been praying for my children and they've turned away from God. A perversion. Folks, this morning, it's time the church woke up. It's time God's people got on seriously, got on their knees and pleaded with God like Hannah did for a transformation and a change. 
and there's going to be a revival around. I want to tell you something. I've been living for this for the last 40 years. And I make no apologies this morning for saying that we need a heavenly kick in the pants. We need the dissension, the descent of the Holy Spirit upon the church, upon the city, upon the nation. This is just not, not, not a nice Mother's Day sermon at all. This is about a woman who God had a purpose for her. Now it says in verse 5 that he, he closed her womb. So what does it mean that he closed the womb? Well, she wasn't able to conceive. And, and the word used in the older terms were she was barren. And to add to that, to add to that, uh, this other wife, this r revival, th this uh, uh, person who, who, who was against her, the woman that had the children, they all came to worship year after year, but every time they came to worship, this other woman gave her a hard time. She mocked her and she said, you barren one. And when are you going to have kids? I want to tell you something. I think you might already know that in those days, for a woman to be childless and to be barren and to be infertile, she was a disgrace. She was looked down on as being a disgrace. Now I read in Genesis, of course, that God said to the man and the woman, Multiply and replenish the earth. He never talks about being barren. He talks about multiplying and replenishing the earth. But you know, through sin and, and through other reasons, uh, people are unable to conceive. And some people go through great sorrows for this. I've known them personally. And so let me say this to you. God had a purpose. Elkanah was a loving husband and provided for both his wives, but God had a wonderful plan, not just for Hannah, uh, but for Israel. Now, the, the context of what we're talking about this morning is, is really the first four chapters of this book. Wonderful reading and wonderful insights that God gives us as we read and meditate through it. And, and, and as my sister was saying, how when you open the word and you see the word is for you, how deeply God can speak to us and change us. Now preacher, pastor, my wife and I, each day we pray together morning and night and we plead for this church we plead for you as the pastor and your wife and we plead that God will do something and you in this place it's no good talking about the history when there was 300 children here and this place was overflowing and they had to put people out in the back room we need God now and what God calls us to is repentance and if there are sins and there are things that we've tolerated in this church we shouldn't have, we need to repent of it. We need to confess it. We need to deal with these strongholds and these hindrances that hinder the wonderful work of God. Now in my time on this earth and, and in ministry, I have seen churches that were bound by some people who were stuck in the mud and couldn't see further than their nose and to dictate to everybody else in the church what they'll do and what they won't do. I'll tell you what, Jesus is Lord of the church, not the Pope, not the hierarchy, not even our church unions that should be there to help us dictate to the local church. Jesus is Lord of the church.
And so it says that God caused this woman to be childless because he had a great plan for Israel. Now when we come to look at this woman's life, she was really, really hurting. Well, I just read it to you how that um, she, she got to a stage where her rival would give her a hard time until she was so depressed she wouldn't even eat, couldn't lift her head up. She was downcast. When she prayed, what did she say? Before the priest Eli and to the Lord. It says how that she prayed. Out of a heart. And she said, no, my Lord, I haven't been tipsy or getting drunk, but I am deeply troubled. I am pouring out my soul to the Lord. I do not, ta do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying out of the anguish and the grief and the ridicule and the hurt of my soul. And when I read this, I started to weep myself because I felt for her. The deep hurt, the deep rejection, the shame, the disgrace that surrounded being childless and being barren. And you know what? God heard her prayer. God heard her prayer. But there was something about a prayer that was so unselfish. She said, you give me a child, and I won't, won't be keeping him for myself, I'll give him back to the Lord all the days of his life. He will have the Nazarite vow. And that's what she did. Now then, the sad thing about this story was, just changing from Hannah to the national scene, there was so much of the religious system that day is like the religious system of this day, where fornication is tolerated. We're talking about premarital sex. We're talking about adultery being excused. We're talking about churches who have homosexual ministers standing in the pulpit denying the word of God. And many of our many of our local churches in this city I've known the history of. And it just hasn't been people sleeping around with other people's wives and husbands, but it's been pastors who who should be shepherds who should be leading by example. And there's been many cases in different denominations where this has gone on. And unless we re repudiate this wickedness and this immorality and this impurity that goes on in the name of church and Christianity, unless we take a stand, we're going to be like some of the great cities and great societies of the world that we only find the ruins and the foundations of now. You know the, the, the great powerful Rome, they fell through living in sex perversion. Now, I don't know about you, but I have seen times when God moved. I, I've seen times to the extent at youth camps sometimes where I was involved, where young men mature young men, were, were so much under the burden of God that we went for a walk out into a paddock and, and they were laying down and we were walking over them because the power of God was coming on them. When since have we seen a church weeping and crying in repentance because God was there and God was moving?
Now, you know, people say, oh, it's the end times, and Jesus said things were going to be bad. He sure did, and so did the apostles. But you know what else he said? He said, occupy till I come. And then he said, I am with you to the end of the age. He didn't say, have a grumble party and all get together and say we should close the church because God's not working. He said, seek me. When you seek me and search for me, with all your heart you'll find me. And I found in my own life when I get to the end of myself and I cry before God on my knees, do I get released from my burdens? And listen, I'm not, not here to be self-centered, but to give a testimony. My longing as a Christian, as a member of this church, with my wife and with all of you, my longing is that we will have a visitation from God. We don't have to measure ourselves by the, the dull, uneventful religious system we live among. Now, you know what it says of old Eli and his sons? I'll read it to you. It says in chapter 1 that they were the three priests. But then we read in chapter 2 and verse 12, it says, Eli's sons were wicked men. They had no regard for the Lord. Huh. They were in the ministry. They were wicked and they had no regard for the Lord. In fact, they were stealing from those bringing the best offerings to the Lord. And then down in verse 22, it says that Eli was very old. And he heard about everything his sons were doing in Israel. How they slept with the women who served at the entrance of the tent. Whether you call it fornication or whether you call it adultery or whether you call it sleeping around is an abomination before God. Let's get it straight this morning. We don't live by the standards of the world. We don't live by the standards of Hollywood. One of the problems is we look at too much that comes from Hollywood. It's like a, an immoral sewer line from Hollywood to our, our lounge room. Now listen, my dear ones, I have learned through experience, I have learned this, that if I'm going to be ready for the Lord's Day and for the morning worship and whatever else goes on, I've got to spend time with God the night before. I've got to get up early and I've got to allow the Spirit of Jesus to come upon me. So when I come to church, I come to add something. Okay, instead of uh, making a, a clinic of the church and wanting to get your weekly shot in the arm to hopefully stay spiritually alive till next week, I want to tell you something. If all of God's people, who every one of us have the priesthood of every believer, if we prepare ourselves and we expect to meet with God when we come to church rather than a tradition or a habit or, or, or a weekly chore as some people call it, we will see God come among us. We will see hearts on flame for, for God. There was a church that caught on fire. But there was a man that used to go to that church and he was fed up with the dirge, the humdrum, the lack of faith. And one morning he looked out from his backyard and he saw this church was on fire, literally on fire. And he grabs a big six-gallon bucket and he races down to help. And the pastor says to him, man, he said, I haven't seen you for a long time. And he said, no, pastor. He said, no, I haven't seen this church on fire for a long time either. Let's draw our thoughts together. This woman that was hurting so deeply 
and felt it every year and was even judged wrongly by the high priest. She was, in the old terms, she was barren and therefore she was a disgrace and she was hurting and she was being insulted by her rival, the other wife. But then, after the worship was over, she went to God in prayer. We've read that prayer. That she was praying out of her deep hurt. And God heard her. And when we as a church and a community get serious about prayer and go after God with all of our longings and all of our strength, we will see God do something mighty, not only among us but among this nation. It's happened many, many times before and it happened on this occasion. The priesthood was corrupt. And it also says that the word of God in chapter 3 and verse 1 it says, Now the boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli that in those days the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. Not many people were having dreams and visions. God wasn't speaking anymore. They were just going along, grabbing what they could and dishonouring the Lord and putting down praying people. Now I want to challenge us all this morning to see that from the prayers of this praying woman came this child who was given to the Lord and by the time we get to chapter 3, we see he's a young boy ministering before the Lord and ministering before old Eli. But God was promising judgment on Eli and his family, which he, he, you can read about in chapter 4. And what does it say in chapter 3? It firstly says that in verse 7, now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. That's verse 7. But then we read that the Lord called to Samuel. And he called to him three times. And, and, and Samuel finally said, Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And there's a willing heart that have been given to the Lord, who responded warmly to the call of the Lord and the word of the Lord when a nation was spiritually and morally at the bottom and when the enemy was overrunning, the Philistines were overrunning Israel. And in one dash of warfare, they lost 30,000 soldiers. God's judgment fell on this house of Eli because he allowed his sons to commit immorality around the tabernacle of the Lord and do their own thing and grab the best of the offerings and, and carry on in a covetous, selfish, arrogant way. Now we've got to stand up for God and we've got to get back to, to the laws of God and we've got to get back to the word of God and we've got to get back to true worship and we've got to get rid of all this convenient stuff that we lived through in this age where we talk about uh, the lucky land of Australia and go on sinning and go on disobeying the laws of God. So what happened? Listen, we're closing with this. It says in verse 19 of chapter 3, And the Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, 
from Dan to Beersheba recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh and there revealed himself to Samuel through his word. Through his word. Did you hear? Our pastor was trying to say this this morning, and he did say it, that it's through the word of God we hear the voice of God that our lives change. Now, I've asked Christians before. How long is it since you've had a meal? And it was three, go, three day, days ago since I've had breakfast. They're looking pretty wonky. Aren't they? They're feeling pretty weak, aren't they? Why is it we think we can get a shot in the arm on Sunday morning enough to last us for a week when we live in a world that is constantly against God? Uh, and if we're walking in the power of the Spirit, if we're walking in the Word of God, then we will get opposition. The Bible says that. All those that live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer some form of persecution. My dear people, our dear people here this morning, will we take God in his word? Will we not be content with the status quo? With a few of our old religious habits? while we watch the world go to hell, while we watch our whole society sodden with sex perversion and every other sort of perversion, and we as the church are supposed to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth, and we stand by. And we watch multitudes. Look, as we drove this morning, my wife read on, on our phone that in two of our cities, there was 20 people that died of COVID last night, just in the last 24 hours. Were they ready for hell or were they ready for heaven? I would say on the law of averages, most of them wouldn't have known Jesus. Isn't that sad? I look at my neighbours and we reach out to our neighbours in every way that we can. We've selected five neighbours that we visit that we give to, that we pray for. Every day and every week we pray for them. And they're gradually opening up. Their hearts are getting softer. And here it is. There was this great revival where the word of God was heard and where this Samuel, who was the result of answer the prayer and where this woman who was barren became fertile and the country was transformed and God raised up one of the greatest men he's ever raised up in the history of the Bible. I, I challenge you this morning, what are you going to do with the opportunities that we in this free land of Australia have? Dear Father, thank you for your work. And thank you there's a place we can come, whether we feel like it or not, to call out to you and just simply say, Lord, where we're at is not good enough. We need to hear you, Lord. We need to hear your conviction, your voice of conviction and of comfort and of encouragement in these days. And right now, Lord, we pray for everyone in this room that may be going through the loss of their loved one, that are, that are going through trials financially, health-wise, or whatever. And yet you have a listening ear for, to every one of us. And Lord, I pray that this morning, he bowed before you, you will start something off in this church that will take it far beyond our imagination. For your word says that God will do far in excess of what we think or imagine according to the power that lives in us. All, everyone say amen. Everyone say with a loud voice, yes, Lord, amen.
this acts upon our confession, our confession of him in Jesus' name. Amen.